Okay. Hello and welcome to the Gradle Team Workshop Series. At today's workshop, we will address the topic of negotiating your salary. So since it's our last workshop of the semester and in recognition of Graduate Student Appreciation Week, which was last week, um, one of our lucky attendees today will win some swag um, at the end of the workshop and you must be present to win. So if you're here, stay on till the end, please. All right, so my name is Debbie Mikutsky and I am the coordinator of services and programs for graduate student legal aid and I use she, her pronouns. Um, this workshop is sponsored by Graduate Student Legal Aid, and you may not know that Legal Aid has a variety of services, and you've already paid for them because you paid your graduate student fee. So there are three types of virtual consultations. Um, you could consult with our director and attorney, Zach Mundy on a variety of topics. Um, something he often helps students with is those who get in a car accident and just don't know what to do. Um, it can be a very complicated process, especially if you're injured. Um, Zach is happy, happy to help students um, with that and all kinds of other issues. Um, we offer legal consultations on immigration matters. Once a month, we have an immigration attorney meet with students to address those issues, those problems related to immigration. Um, we provide advocacy for students who have been charged by the university. And finally, for our in-person service, um, we have notary services. I am a notary and we have another notary on staff. We are happy to help you. So um, before I introduce our speaker, I have a few announcements. Um, Automatic closed captioning has been enabled for those who want to read along. Um, near the end of the workshop, I will post a link to a survey and boy, do we need your feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Let us know if you like this workshop and share your ideas for other topics. We will email links to the survey, the slides and the recording this afternoon to everyone who registered, whether you attended this workshop or not. So watch your email for that. And for all of our workshops, we post um, links on our website, which is gradlegalaid.umd.edu. So let's get started with the topic of the day, salary negotiations. I am pleased to welcome back a speaker who has been presenting this workshop since, and I had to look it up, 2016. Wow. <laughs> Her name is Dr. Susan Martin, and Dr. Martin is the Program Director of Professional and Career Development at the UMD Graduate School. She designs, implements, and delivers career and professional development services for doctoral students and postdocs. And we are so lucky to have Susan here today. She presents a very engaging um, and thought-provoking workshop on this important topic. So Susan, welcome back and thank you so much for making time to be here with us today. Thank you, it's my pleasure. And it's so nice to look around and see names and if cameras were on faces that I recognize. So one of the things that I um, like to start with is if in the chat box, if everyone could go ahead and just put in a yes or a no, I want to know, yes or no, have you ever negotiated a job offer? Have you ever negotiated a job offer? No, 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 no. Yes. Varun, yes. No, no, no. Anybody else? So it looks like the vast, oop, yes. Yes, Shilpa, great. No, no. All right, so I see two yeses and lots of no's. So you notice I use the words evaluating and negotiating a job offer. It's just not about salary. So I am going, I do have slides. You'll get the slides later. Um, I am going to share my screen, but I'm gonna pop back and forth so that there'll be plenty of time for questions. Debbie's gonna monitor the chat and 
keep track of questions that land in there and hopefully I will get them all answered. We only have 50 minutes together, so I, I may skip some of my slides, but that's okay, you'll get them this afternoon. So let me go ahead and share my slides. And that's me. I have a graduate assistant, April Fuller, that if you're a doc student, you may have met along the way. Uh, there are actually four career services offices on campus. So I know some of you in the room are from the Smith School, some are from engineering. If you're not in the Smith School, public policy or engineering, then your home career center is the University Career Center and the President's Promise. And I'll be glad to answer any questions you have about the services that they offer later. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. You can look at it later. There are things that you need to learn how to do to manage your career moving forward and being able to effectively negotiate and choose to accept or decline offers is one of those things that you'll do throughout your life and your career. So what we're going to do is we're really going to focus on what you should do when you get an offer. I'm going to provide you a method that you can recreate for evaluating an offer. And then we're gonna go over some of the basic steps of the salary negotiation process. And I want you to, again, continue to drop questions in the chat box and we'll make sure that we address them. So the first thing I wanna point out is that you should try to avoid or deflect discussing salary until you actually have a job offer. So if you recall, the very first phase of, of the interview process is usually a screening interview. They may ask you there what your salary requirements are. I've got a few suggestions about things that, I, that you might say. Let's see if I'm a good fit before we discuss salary. And you definitely want to start doing the things that I'm gonna recommend, clarifying your priorities, figuring out your post-graduation budget bottom line, how much is it going to cost you to live, pay rent, commute, buy food? Um, because it's pretty safe to say that your post-graduation salary will be significantly more than what you're making as a research assistant, if that's the position that you're currently in. And the other thing is, as soon as you start applying for jobs or while you're exploring careers, you really want to be doing some salary research. So that if you're asked one of these questions over and over and they demand an answer, if you're, if you're pressed, you're able to respond with a broad salary range in that initial interview. Whatever you tell them does not pin you down, but you wanna demonstrate that you understand that, there, that there's a salary range here. And you might even ask if they have a particular salary range that the position is budgeted for. And this is true, particularly with grant funded positions. Okay, a little bit about offers, and I wanna kind of put this on the table. So when you have that second round interview, right, the on-site, even if it's by Zoom, a verbal offer may come at the end of the day from an HR person, or it may come later by phone or email. And it, it, the reason why they do that is they want to do that verbal offer so they don't have to redo paperwork, offer letters and contracts. So if you get one of those phone calls or an email, you want to make sure, particularly with a phone call, that you have all the details. Take notes. Ask them when you're going to get the offer in writing. And most importantly, do not respond on the spot. If someone's pressing you for an answer right then and there to take the job, or if you go ahead and say yes because you're so excited, and then when you start to think about it, it's not what you want, it's always best to be really appreciative, to say how much you're, you know, that you're appreciative of this offer, you're excited, and that you, that you need to take some time to review it, you might ask them when they need your response back if, if they haven't told you. It's very typical for an employer to give 48 hours. Now, if you need more time, you can ask for it, but not more than a week. Because when you start asking for more than a week, it seems like you're not interested in the position. I oftentimes have conversations with students who say they have other pending offers. Now, submitting an application does not equal an offer. So a pending offer means you've made it through a screening interview if there was one, 
you've had a second round interview, or maybe you've even progressed through other rounds of interviews, if that's something that that company does. So you don't have an offer until you have an offer. Now, if like, let's, let's suppose you get an, a job offer today by email, but you had two other on-site interviews last week. It's, it's totally okay to be transparent and ask for more time because you do have some other interviews that were in process and that you wanna honor those processes. But again, you wanna make, you wanna be very cognizant of where you are with each of the applications that you've put in. And until you really have that second round interview and get an offer, you really don't have an offer. But it's totally okay to go back and say, I have an offer. Can you let me know when I might uh, hear back from you? Because I really am interested in this position. So it's okay to open up that conversation. Okay, Debbie, I'm gonna pause there. Have any questions come in about anything that I've said? Nope. Okay. No questions yet. Okay, so now I'm gonna actually walk you through some steps and there is a second worksheet. Uh, it comes from a LinkedIn learning course called Negotiating Your Job Offer. And if you are a UMD student, you have access to LinkedIn Learning. And uh, there are quite a number of good video courses and audio courses in there on negotiating and evaluating job offers. So the, the most important thing is to clarify what's most important to you. And I want to um, stop here for a minute. For those of you who had a chance to look at the worksheet, I'd like you to drop in the chat, what are the two or three most important things? Is it location, salary, is it start date? So let's just see what kinds of things are important to those of you who are here in this workshop. Okay, so if you take out that worksheet, if you had a chance to look at it, okay. It's the getting what you want. Healthcare, learning opportunities, flexible schedule, time off, excellent. Okay, salary's not in that one, interesting. Let's, let's hear from a few more people before I go on. It's gonna be different for everyone. You're all in different places. And I, I let learning opportunities, intellectual stimulation, collaboration, money, financial gain, absolutely. The type of job, the company culture, what you're working on, what product, super. It's, it's interesting to see how remote work is, is uh, popping in here. Life work balance, healthcare, great. Healthcare is really important. Super. So as you can see, different things are different to each of you, right? And I will tell you that over different phases in your career in life, different things will become important, right? It's going to depend on the roles that you have going on in your life. Some of you are going to be are already caretakers. Some of you are, have children. Some of you have partners. There's all kinds of things that are important. And it's really it's really important for you to stay in touch with what's important, okay? Because we're talking right now about the criteria that you're gonna evaluate your current job offers against, not the work that you're gonna do for your whole life, okay? So this, these priorities become the criteria to which you evaluate specific job offers, okay? Are there any questions about that? I'll pause for a minute, just unmic yourself or type it in the chat. All right. Okay. So I mentioned that it, you may get an offer, but have recently had other offers. And I just went through this about two weeks ago with a doc student. They, they had an offer and they had two other interviews like the week before. And I, I, encourage you to use this worksheet and create a chart where you put the criteria that are important to you and you list each of the options and you can choose to rate them numerically or use a plus or minus. But honestly, I used to do this on a whiteboard that I had in my office back in the pre-times. When you put job offers or pending job offers against each other like this and, and rate them and or think about pros and cons, 
it can really help you clarify what is the, the best fit for you. The person I worked with actually decided that one of the positions she was definitely not interested in because of its location. She has a partner and that partner's work is here and she was not willing to move to the upper Midwest and be apart from that person. But when we started our conversation, she was saying, I have these three job offers and I'm not sure which one I wanna take. So when you start creating this type of chart and doing the comparison, you get clarity of thought. Okay, I'm gonna pause. I'm gonna see people's faces if they're there. So you notice we haven't even talked about salary negotiation yet. We're just talking about getting clarity. And I know for many soon to be graduates and particularly international graduate students, you may feel like, oh my God, if, oh my gosh, if I get an offer, I have to take it. I absolutely have to take it. I can't turn it down. And I would strongly encourage you to, um, if you're feeling that way, to schedule an appointment with your primary career center to talk about that. Again, because of the timing, I'm just, and I'm not an expert on OPT and I'm not the IS office, but I know that there's a window of time between when you apply for OPT and when you get your approval that you can be continuing on in your job search. Okay, that's one thing. You don't always have to accept the first offer unless it's the right offer. The, the additional thing to keep in mind is depending on when you're graduating, you still have time to adjust your job search strategies. And so if you're finding that you're not getting offers or you're not advancing in the processes, don't wait until the last minute to schedule time with a career center staff member. Um, talking with a staff member like me can help you really look at how you're running your job search so that you can be most effective and move on in the process, get more screening interviews and really excel at those on-site interviews. Okay, so the, hopefully you, you all will have the opportunity to have more than one offer, okay? But if you don't have more than one offer, that's still okay because you definitely want to do a negotiation. So let me go back to my presentation. Um, and I wanna know now in the chat, could you type in why you're really, really uncomfortable about doing a salary negotiation? Let, let's look at some of these. Let's look at some of these. What, what makes you uncomfortable or what do you fear about negotiating your salary and even a job offer start date, not knowing my worth. I don't know how to bring it up. I'm going to lose the opportunity. It's hard for me to argue. Okay. Interest. These are great comments. <clears throat> so I'm getting the sense that talking about money feels awkward. You're not sure what you're worth. And just having that interaction, it may even feel like a, um, like a conflict. Okay. Well, there's some good news here. <clears throat> so your starting salary matters. I wanna give you some real practical, oops, some practical things. Your starting salary matters because every subsequent raise is usually gonna be a percentage of what you started with. And if you don't negotiate and even get a few thousand dollars more now, in the long run, as your salary compounds, you're gonna lose out. Um, there's research that shows that um, just a year out of college, women are behind because they um, are less likely to negotiate. And it's not just a gender issue. Um, this is really a family issue, a household issue. So if you're in a partnership and you're bringing home less money, it, it becomes an issue for, for both of you or all of you living in that household. So everyone needs to really think about the importance of doing that negotiation. So I wanna show you that the comments you put in the box are normal. Most, 55% uh, um, of women as compared to 39% of man, men are, are apprehensive. Almost half of men always negotiate. Millennials, and I'm gonna guess that many of you are millennials, 
millennials, half did not negotiate any pay increase in their current job. And almost 80% didn't negotiate for their first job. So it looks like people learn later that they need to negotiate, but coming out of the gate, they're not negotiating. And there are definitely gender issues. You'll notice on the slide, I have a book that's targeted specifically toward women. And once people are in jobs, it looks like two thirds of people in this um, survey did not know how to ask for more. And actually asking for a raise around the time of performance appraisals is a very normal thing. <clears throat> okay, so how, that's the view from you all as students, soon to be graduates, people who are gonna negotiate. But what about employers? How do they take this? <clears throat> So 80% of employers are not upset or offended when job seekers negotiate. So think about that. They're expecting you to negotiate. HR people expect that, that there's going to be an ask for more salary. So negotiation and asking for more money in that starting salary is normal. And once in jobs, 48% or almost half of the HR folks expect employees to ask for a raise at least once a year. So this is just part of doing business. And I know in many cultures talking about money is taboo, however, in many cultures, negotiation is definitely part of business transactions, and your acceptance of a job offer is a business transaction. But there's way more than salary you can negotiate. Um, start date is one of them. And I get a lot of questions from students saying, oh, my OPT hasn't come through yet, or I really, you know, I just finished my doctorate. I want to take a month off. Can I ask for a later start date? And in many cases, that's possible. So for example, if, if something is a brand new position and there's no one who's been there, it may not make an, a, a difference at all for the employer if you start two or four weeks later. Okay. You, all you have to do is ask. Um, more and more remote and hybrid schedules are normal. So you should ask sort of how companies are handling things. Flex time, being able to come in later or start your day later, or have a chunk of time off in the middle of the day to go to kids' soccer games, for example. I'm just naming something. Um, companies may um, offer a relocation or a travel reimbursement. If they don't tell you what their standard is, you might even ask about it. I know for many of the top the top tech companies, there are stock options and signing bonuses. Um, and then it's also possible to negotiate travel and professional development funding to continue on with learning. The things I have in red are things that are negotiable when you are offered an academic job. And I just wanted to point them out. You know, service, startup package, pre-tenure, leave, time to tenure. And these are the kinds of things you definitely would want to discuss with your faculty mentor if you're on the academic job market, because things are handled differently in different disciplines. Okay, particularly the startup packages in the sciences are something that your advisor should be able to, to give you info on. Okay, so I mentioned before, understanding your budget is important. So you all are going to be given a number when you um, are offered a job, it's probably an annual salary. To figure out what's going to go into your bank account every month or 26 times a year, if it's every week, you can use one of these paycheck calculators. And when you do that, it lets you figure out what that gross or job offer amount is minus taxes, health insurance, et cetera. So I strongly encourage students to do a really rough budget based on this take-home pay. And this may be totally new for some of you who are used to living on a part-time 
salary or even a, a teaching or research assistantship. Debbie, it looks like we must have a question. Um, I, you, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want you to finish your thought. We had a question about, um, could you define professional development opportunities? Okay. Wonderful, that's a great question. So for example, when I started this job, I knew that there was a conference I wanted to go to every year. And to go to that conference, to travel, to register, it was going to be about $2,500. So I, right there when I talked with the director, I mentioned that I wanted to attend this conference in July. So I was starting my new job in June that I wanted to go in July. Would he approve that? <clears throat> and I laid out on the table my expectation that I'd be able to attend every year. And I asked, is that something that the Career Center can support? So it's, it's usually travel for funding. You, if they haven't told you in the interview process that they, you know, how they encourage professional development, you, that's something you should be asking about through the interview process. Ask, you might ask the uh, individuals who will be your coworkers what types of professional development activities they participated in over the past couple of years. You might ask them if they had to bear the cost of them or did the employer pay? How does that get handled? And so professional development are opportunities to really learn new skills, participate in conferences, uh, get additional training. I hope that answers the question. And it depends again on what type of job, what discipline and what the kinds of skills would be. But most employers expect you to keep learning new things. And most of them are gonna talk with you in the interview process about the kinds of professional development opportunities they offer. But if they don't mention it, ask about it. Okay, I'm not gonna go over the <clears throat> these steps. Um, I'm gonna, I just wanna walk through each of them. Um, I'll walk through each of them in more detail. But the, the, the main point of this slide is that you want to do some research upfront to get these salary ranges based on a number of data points. You wanna consider the offer against your budget, and then you're gonna come up with a negotiating strategy. And I recommend talking about salary first, so that you don't end up compromising that as you ask for some other things. So take care of that first. Um, in terms of your own ability to do this, you're gonna to wanna to practice and you are actually gonna go ahead and conduct the negotiation. It usually happens verbally, but I've had some students who get an offer by email and then they open up the conversation and have the negotiation by email. But if at any point, the, if the person on the other end says, let's talk about it, you're probably gonna end up having a conversation. And <clears throat> always get a revised offer in writing and make sure you read it really carefully to be sure that it represents what you discussed. Mistakes happen sometimes. I'm not, I'm not saying an employer is gonna be um, deceitful, but you know, you, they're updating documents. They're working with lots of people. Mistakes can happen. Right. And you and always I, go ahead, Debbie. Just wanted to interject because you're recommending that folks maybe get someone to review their job contract. Our attorney, Zach Mundy, will review your job contract with you and point out anything that, that you might want to consider more carefully. Um, but it's always good to get a second set of eyes, another opinion about that. Absolutely. Because it can feel like, oh my gosh, I'm signing this. But there are, there are lots of standard language that go into these, and I'm sure Zach could also walk you through it. And I know Engineering Career Services also does each year, or maybe even twice a year, they do a session with an attorney named Mark Rhodes, where they also talk about um, employment contracts. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so this is where um, the question Micheline asked in the chat at the very beginning. She asked about where do I get salary information? And I've put some, um, excuse me, I'm gonna take a sip of water. So there's a tool called the Occupational Outlook Handbook, which is published by the US federal government and it's tied to labor data. And uh, 
you can get pretty, I'm going to call it high level information. So what does a data scientist earn? What does a data analyst earn? And you can even look at those data by state. There are, there are links to different states in the Occupational Outlook Handbook. When you look at the um, sites like LinkedIn Salary, Indeed, and Glassdoor, you're getting data that users of these platforms put in. And oftentimes you'll see a pretty wide range there's usually a filter by which you can filter on different year, number of years of, ex, of experience, okay? And um, all of these are a good starting point, but I will tell you, oftentimes surveys that are done by professional associations or even conversations with alumni who have a broad and deep knowledge of an industry, that can help you refine what you're worth. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to take a quick minute and I wanna, I'm gonna go to LinkedIn salary, <clears throat> okay? Just to kind of show you, for those of you who haven't done this, and I am going to, um, let's see, I think I am going to use, <clears throat> I want to pick, I'm going to put in communication specialist. All right, and I'm going to put in uh, Washington, DC. So back to um, Washington, Baltimore area. Okay. So what LinkedIn presents you with is sort of this curve. And you'll notice that the median 50% of the number of responses below and above are at 60,000. So just sort of eyeballing this, I am gonna bet that these are for people with less experience. And then as you get up here, you start to see, I'm gonna click more insights. Okay. So you'll notice uh, one person reported a, um, a bonus, that's interesting. But now specific companies are even listed. And this kind of, again, shows you ranges. So back to my point about getting some additional information. For those of you who already use Terrapins Connect, you might see if you can identify Maryland alumni in the Terrapins Connect alumni platform who would be willing to talk with you about Innova. And for example, uh, how does ANOVA stack up against some of the other folks in the area? Okay. So this is giving some broad, broad um, data. It's really important to look at some of the job descriptions that are here so that you can start to parse out. Perhaps there's a communic communication specialist type of job that's much more entry level. It's reporting to a senior person who would be determining the strategic planning, for example. So when you look at other job postings, you start to get a sense of um, how does the, the job I'm being offered fit into the, I'm gonna call it the career trajectory. Okay, now this is all years of experience. Let's look at one to five. Ah, base salary around 58. Let's look at, let's propose you had a PhD and we're gonna count six years of training. That puts you about $10,000 more. Okay, so let me stop there for a minute. Now, it takes some practice. It's an art and it's a science. And this again is where a career center staff member can help you with this. There's not one exact answer, <laughs> which is really frustrating to students. Um, there's one other data source, and we have that here in this career center and the other career centers as well. There's a National Association of Colleges and Employers, and they report some average salary data by discipline with some typical job titles. So that's another data source you can look at. 
Okay, let's see. Any questions about finding those data? <clears throat> Oh, the source I just mentioned, it's the NACE salary survey. And it's something that the university is a member of this association. And so we have access to those data. So if you make an appointment with the University Career Center, we can look up the data and talk about your specific situation. Great question. Thanks, Jordan. Ah, thank you. I don't know that they make their salary data public. I believe you have to be a member to access it. Thanks, Debbie. Okay, let's see how we're doing on time. All right, pretty good. So let me go back and share my screen because I wanna make sure I get through this with you. So I've already mentioned this, you know, when you're doing your research, you want to make sure, um, and particularly in science jobs or even uh, artificial intelligence or data science jobs, there may be different jobs that have similar job titles. So you really have to look at the tasks for that particular position to make sure that you're looking at the right salary band. The other part is different industries pay different amounts, right? So let me give you a concrete example. There are data analysts that work in the university's institutional research office. And I can tell you the salaries that they earn in higher ed are lower than the, what they might be making if they were doing similar data analysis things in private industry or even in federal government. Okay, so understanding the salary structures in different industries is important. Okay, if you're working for a small nonprofit that's primarily grant funded, the salary that they offer you may be coming from a grant, which may be a bit lower than if you were working for a Fortune 500 company, which goes back to your priorities. And some of you said the job and the culture matter, and that's where the trade-offs happen. Okay, so I mentioned there's not one right answer. You kind of have to synthesize and this is where talking to an experienced career center person. Okay, now this is where we're gonna get into the negotiation. This is on that check sheet, that second check sheet. This is where you figure out your strategy. You have to have a rationale that's gonna inform how you have this conversation about why are you worth more money? And I will tell you, just having an advanced degree is not the right answer. And I go through this oftentimes with PhDs. Just because you have X degree doesn't mean automatically that you're going to get more money. Okay. However, you want to think about what I call it, what you're going to bring to the party. Do you have some experience that is particularly going to be beneficial and add value to the company? Um, Along the way, as you interview, you may realize that the job description to which you applied is really a bit different than what the job is that you're going to perform. So if there's some discrepancies, you want to be able to point that out and say, you know, I've, I've learned through this that I'm not just going to be doing simple data analytics. I'm going to be doing forecasting models, and that's going to really tap into the expertise that I've gained here in graduate school. And this is the point where you, um, you figure out what your target is, what you want to earn, and then you look at what 5% more of the offer is, 10% more of the, beyond the offer, and 15% more beyond the offer. Now, if you get an offer that's clearly below market value, you may determine, I'm just not, and they won't budge, you may determine that you're not going to negotiate, you're not going to go through and negotiate because they're never going to meet the market value for that position. It's okay to turn a job down if it's not a fair offer, provided there are not other competing values, okay? But you want to kind of get a sense of what's five, 10 and 15% more than the offer that they've given. And you wanna know where you wanna land. And you always ask for more than wh where you want to land because 
they're going to expect you to give a little, right? All right. You're going to go back and um, make sure that um, you've done your salary research and you know how the offer stacks up against it. I think I see Debbie raising a hand again. Yep, go ahead. <laughs> um, I have an example that um, might help even further explain what you're addressing. Um, so a student says, if I have experience in one field, let's say software development of two to three years, and I switch my job profile after my master's to say robotics, mm -hmm. which is kind of a subset of software development. Mm -hmm. So should he or she expect more or be within the range, that salary well, range? Well, let me tell you, that's a complex question, right? So if you're applying for a robotics job, you need to know what these robotics jobs are paying. And I'm going to venture a guess that software skills are important in robotics jobs. So perhaps you're coming in with um, some valuable software experience that's going to matter to the team. Okay, so do you see how the train of thought has gone? Um, I do encounter some doctoral students who worked, let's say for 10 years before they came back and got their doctorate. And they may have been working in a, let's say a managerial level. And now they've done some additional training and they're gonna step back in maybe in a slightly different type of role. Maybe they're gonna move more into a research role. And they may find that the types of jobs they're looking at now have a very different pay scale than being in a very high level management position where you're supervising a lot of people. Okay, so just because you earn something before doesn't mean you automatically step in there. With some slight exceptions in the federal government, um, pay bans are different, but again, it's not a yes or no. It's how does that previous experience track onto this job and matter to this position that you're being offered? Good question. All right. So we talked about your strategy and determining why you're gonna make the case. So the reasons why you make the case are you've done salary research, you've seen similar jobs in this region. There, let's, I'm gonna make easy numbers. They're offering you 50, but you know that the jobs are paying between 58 and 68. So first point is that they're offering you below market value. Second point is you've perhaps done these things in previous work. So you're gonna step right in. You're not gonna have any learning curve. You're ready to go. Um, and so that's your perspective, but then you wanna think about the employer's perspective. And this is again, where conversations with alumni make a difference. So I've been hearing from some students that I've worked with that when one is an intern in a high tech company, all of those interns who are being converted to full-time positions are being offered the same salary. Hmm, interesting. So you need to make sure you understand, does this employer, how do they negotiate? Okay. Another thing, within the federal government, typically one will get an offer, like there's a pay band and there's, I think there's 12 steps in each pay or 10 steps in each pay band. Most of the time I'm seeing the offers at the bottom of the pay band. And when students go back, they might ask for somewhere toward the middle of the pay band. So the federal government will offer you whatever that pay band is, but they're, they're not likely to jump up from like, let's say a grade 12 to a grade 13, but they are willing to move along the pay band. But you would only know that if you would talk to someone who's employed by the federal government. Um, and then my other advice is to start thinking about how, what words you're gonna to use to start the conversation and the negotiation. And I'm gonna show you some of them in just a moment. All right, so here's the third handout. Debbie, if you can drop that in the chat. 
I'm gonna, I have time to quickly walk people through this handout. You don't read it now. You're gonna go back and read it later. Um, I wanted you all to see a concrete example of what I just showed you. So the first few pages show, give a job description and talk about the applicant's qualifications. And here's the little info from salary.com. And then it walks through how to figure out what your target is and does the five, 10 and 15% increase person's budget is in there. So you can read this later. What I want you to do now, I'm going to put you in some small groups and you'll notice, and I've done this every time, every time I do this workshop in some way, shape or form, and students love this the most. I want one person to be the employer that's green. And I want a second person to actually be the HR person, because I just want you to speak these words. And I'm gonna put you in breakout rooms. I'm gonna put you in groups of four. So that means two people get to try it. I'm gonna put you there just for, four, for five minutes. So that means two of you have to do the role play. You, if you have time, switch it up and do it again. But this is a fantastic opportunity to just step out of your comfort zone and say these words. And, Follow the script just so that you can practice saying the words. Okay, does everyone have the handout? Let me stop sharing so I can see. Everyone should have the handout. Debbie dropped it in. It's the job offer negotiation. Oh no, that's not it, Debbie. It's the one that's on the slide. Let me, let me go ahead. What is the title, Susan? It is Salary Negotiation Worksheet. Salary Negotiation Worksheet. Do you have that in your email? Hold on. I think you just sent me the two. Oh, I didn't. Okay. Um, oh, here right. it is. I apologize. I'm pulling it up right now. Oh, you know what? I've got it right. I can drop the link in. I just copied Thank the you. Link. I apologize. No worries. We're going fast. <clears throat> okay. This worksheet is a case study. So later you can read it and you can see how it follows the slides that we just discussed. You can take your time, you can look at the numbers, but on the very last page, it looks like this. Let me share my screen. It looks like this. And what's in green is what the employee is gonna say. And this assumes that you've received an offer with this beverage association. And here's the HR person, okay? This is low risk. I'm gonna put you in groups of four. Two people need to step up and do it. And this is a great chance for you to practice a little bit. Okay, so let's see, how many people do we have here? Who, 23, 21, I am gonna make, um, five rooms of four. All right. And I'm going to put you in there. I'm just going to give you, I'm not going to give you too much time, but they'll close automatically after four minutes. So you have to go quick. The reason why I'm making you go quick is so that you don't think about this too much. You just do it. Okay, so there you go. You should be joining a breakout room. Two people need to do the role play. One will be the employee and one will be the HR person. All right, I'm gonna pause the video. Can you pause the video, Debbie? Mm -hmm. Thank you. You mean the recording? The recording, yes, thank you. Restart the recording. Thanks, thanks. Okay, so I'm wondering if there are some brave souls who want to uh, say a little bit about what it was like to speak those words and ask for more. There's gotta be a reaction. <laughs> I know there is. I see people laughing. 
<laughs> um, so I was the HR. I can say like it wasn't as awkward for me. Uh, I don't know about the candidate. So yeah. So as who was so um, as the HR person, what did you notice about the role you were playing? Uh, I feel like if the uh, role is aligned to, uh, you know, the experience that the employee has, like the onboarding employee, uh, I think uh, it's fair to say that they should definitely negotiate. And I mean, uh, that also tells me like they know what they're doing and they are aware of their own value. Well, let me tell you, you make an excellent point, Syed. Your, the point you just made was that you were you were acknowledging that this person did their research and it, it I'm reading between the lines, but there was some element of respect that they had done their research and it seemed rational. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, honestly, negotiating does speak something about how you're going to show up as a professional, right? That you are going to ask for what you need and that this is part of professional communication. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. Let's hear from somebody who was the employee. There's gotta be a brave soul out there. I think I saw something in the chat box. Someone- Play the, the, sorry. Go ahead, Martina. Oh, yeah, I played the, the employee and um, I think it was good to see how, an example of how can you justify like what you were saying based on the market research and what you're worth. I think it was good to have that kind of example of how to do it and what kind of explanation to use. Yes, excellent. It's the first time you'd learn anything new. You want to practice and it's nice to have a roadmap. And if you go into LinkedIn or onto YouTube, there are many, many videos that use different language. And I encourage you to look at a bunch of them and practice saying those words. Practice with a roommate. It will boost your confidence even more. And is it Anul? I saw your confidence boosting. Excellent. Practice builds confidence. Okay. Any other comments about this little activity or any questions at all? I, am, I know that our time is officially over at 1.30. I would be glad to stay for another five or 10 minutes and answer a few questions. Debbie, is that okay with you or do you have to, to run? Okay. Any other comments or questions? Any question at all? Um, I have a question about the negotiation, like, because as an international student, it's really important to get a sponsorship um, offer. So how do we negotiate with the sponsorship uh, with the company? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure along the way that they, they, if you had not asked that question along the way, you probably should ask that question. You can also uh, in, uh, we have a tool called Going Global. You can see if that company has sponsored. Um, I think part of it, it, it depends on the size of the company. Larger companies have very large departments that do this all the time. It's going to depend on your um, whether you're a STEM major and have three years. I know most companies, if you're STEM, they wanna get you in the lottery as soon as possible because you can go into that lottery three times. Um, I would say everyone's scenario might be slightly different and this is definitely a conversation to have with a career advisor to get some coaching. Um, you definitely want to feel confident in explaining to them what you will need. Um, smaller and mid-sized employers aren't always aware at the considerably low cost to them. It costs them much more to recruit an employee oftentimes than it would be to, um, to work with an immigration attorney to submit the paperwork. Um, if any of you attended Mark Rhodes' presentation earlier this semester, uh, a good immigration attorney is going to be able to um, talk with you about the different options. I know there are different ways to apply different ways to do it. Um, but the H-1B process, you need to feel conf confident, confident and comfortable talking with your employer about doing it. Um, larger companies do it all the time. You may have fellow students that, that 
were put in the lottery. Um, and then there are gonna be those businesses that are exempt from the lottery. So that's why many of our doc students are looking for faculty positions. So there are some, some types of corporations. So everyone's situation is different. And in most cases, you've already started that conversation before you get a job offer. Uh, I have something to add to it. Uh, so one of my friend actually interviewed at a company and like he went to like three rounds of interviews for an internship. Uh, in the last round, he got rejected because they were not hiring international students. I mean, they can't sponsor. So I guess it's always better to clarify it in the first screening itself. I mean, that way they know what you are expecting. Yeah, and internships can be a little different too than sometimes, I'm not saying that that person, um, internships are more complicated. CPT is more complicated, I know for students. It, it is because the way, and if you go on the IS website and look at the CPT, it explains all of the things that you have to do. And it, it is challenging. And I, I know in this geographic region, it's challenging as well. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is sometimes companies will say that they don't sponsor and a hiring manager finds the right person and they, it, it just depends. So this is where knowing individuals who are at a company and, and even leveraging your own network can make a difference. Thank you, Syed, that's, that's true. That's an unfortunate scenario. But back to the question that was asked, I think being comfortable uh, asking individuals, when they ask you, do you have questions? You might ask them if they've hired international students before and open the conversation up. And I also have another question. I just got an internship or in the summer internship like in February mm -hmm. and I'm, yeah, thank you. And uh, I'm considering to continue to work in the fall. So how can I negotiate with them to get a return offer in fall? Uh, you definitely want to talk to the IS office, right? Um, yes, and I already talked to them and they said I can get a four intern. So I just want to, uh, talk to company like if they are willing to give me a yeah a return offer yeah well have you chatted I mean have you it's early to talk about it yet right once you're in the position internships are a great time to network and meet other people and learn about the work that's being done because in addition to returning in the role you're in you may learn that there are other places where your skills could be valuable so I would say um, how many weeks is your internship going to be? Uh, it should be 13 weeks. Okay. So mm -hmm. there's no magic way to do it. I think in the beginning, right, you're learning and getting settled in and having open communication with whomever your supervisor is about what you like about the environment and really expressing enthusiasm as well as competence in what you're doing. Like you're, you're developing a relationship. Um, and then as you um, are getting feedback at the end, uh, not the very end, you don't wanna be stepping out the door, but you know maybe the, the last quarter or third, you start asking if there are opportunities, might there be an opportunity? I would love to come back. Mm -hmm. okay. Ask. Yeah, thank you. Especially if you have identified some places where you could make, you could have impact. Mm -hmm. So that's why don't just stick in your little unit make time to have lunch with other people, other interns, but also other, other supervisors. As a student, this is a great opportunity to say, you know, I'm, I'm exploring career paths. I'd like to learn more about what you do. So make the ask once you've established a good work record and start to build relationships and then ask. If you don't ask, you can't hear yes. Yes, and last really quick question because I just got a um, message from the uh, another supervisor from another company, and that leader asked me emailed me like asked me for the salary range. I did research like market research, and I saw their uh, salary range is from fifty thousand to sixty thousand something like that. So when they when he asked me, I just emailed back to him. I said maybe I'm a preferred. I'm looking for a position with 
salary ranges from 50,000 to 55,000. And he didn't respond me, like he didn't reply me yet. So I'm kind of, yeah, a little nervous about that. Do you think so I can should? I, can I ask a couple of clarifying questions to make sure I understand? So this mm -hmm. is not for an internship. This is for a permanent position. Yes, because I'm also also looking for the full time job for next year because I'm going to graduate in this December. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if you want to kind of go back over what the position was and what you said, I would definitely. What what program are you in? Are you in Smith? Yes, uh, I'm in the master program in supply chain management. Okay. It, um, it, do you have the ability to meet with John Malone? John Malone. Who career? is your Who's your career person? Seth. It's John. Oh yeah, yeah. I know his name is Seth, but yeah. Oh, I mean, Seth, Seth, Seth. Yeah, okay. Seth, yeah. yeah, because he may know. I mean, I would say when you get that kind of question, the Smith School. I know that they keep data on where their students are doing internships. They may have had some salary data. So route before in the future, before you reply, you might also check in with them to see if they know if there had been an intern there. So who knows? I would check back in with them. You may have been over or you may have been grossly under. You, you never want to undersell yourself either. Yes. Yes. And Debbie has dropped the survey in for the workshop. Thank you for that question. That was a wonderful question. Any other questions? Susan. Excuse me. I know some students need to leave, and yep. um, I had promised that we would do a drawing. For oh, her. yes. This is a beautiful red um, University of Maryland blanket that I got at the bookstore, along with a bunch of other swag. So if we could just pause for a minute so I can first thank you. Wow, what a useful, practical workshop. I love that you had everybody practice saying those words because it's hard. So as always, thank you, Susan, for your wisdom. I also want to thank everybody who attended today. We couldn't do this without you. And again, we need your food feedback. We want to provide good workshops for you. So let's move on to the drawing. Drum roll. The winner of the drawing, assuming that they are still here, is Kenny Chen. C-H-E-N. And it looks like Kenny is still here with us. Yay! Woo! Congratulations on being selected as the winner today. I will reach out to you this afternoon with an email and you will get your swag. So thank you. I didn't know there's a draw <laughs> at the end of the workshop. Good. Glad you enjoyed it. All right, Susan, do you need to wrap things up now or do you have another moment? I just want to say thank you. It, um, I have about two more minutes and then I have to run off to another meeting. Okay. One quick question. Anybody have one? I just want to say this takes practice. It feels scary. However, if you're prepared, if you walk through the steps in that handout, you'll feel more confident to do it. And I will tell you, whatever little bit that you get, you will, first of all, it will help your long-term salary uh, increases, but you're going to respect yourself and you're going to feel like you took a step to grow in an area that you were uncomfortable with before. So go for it. All right. That's a good way to wrap this up. Thanks again, Susan. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week. And remember, Legal Aid is here to help you.